and good evening to all of you uh, uh, <coughs> to this uh, wonderful evening uh, uh, about uh, the uh, the evening talk for key about key factors for success for agile testing by none other than Janet Gregory. Uh, thanks to us, thanks to her for being here in Singapore for the talk, and we have a workshop tomorrow. Uh, <coughs> She uh, just just a bit about her. Uh, she is a Calgary-based consultant specialized in building quality systems. Uh, her passion is promoting agile quality processes in software development. Uh, Co-author of the famous book Agile Testing, uh, which I discovered when I joined uh, uh, my first project in Singapore five years back. I, I tried to uh, I was trying to learn agile QA practices, and the first book which came up was Agile Testing by Janet and uh, Lisa. So we hope to uh, learn a lot today from you, Janet. Always. Thank you. <laughs> How is everybody tonight? Good. So I have one job for you folks, OK? Besides sitting and listening and then asking questions after, is so uh, Riju mentioned Agile Testing, but I brought along our second book, More Agile Testing, and I want to give it away because I don't want to carry it with me on my next segment. It's heavy. Um, so you have to remind me when I'm finished, just before you know the Q&A, right? So you have to remind me to give it away. That's your job. All right. Um, so my plug, but what if you want to tweet, Please do, Janet Gregory CA, uh, CA being for Canada. If you want to send me an email, please send me an email. I like getting emails. They're fun. And that's kind of all I'm going to say about me today. What I want to talk about, it's called success factors. But I really want to uh, try to not convince you, but to kind of share some of the things that I've learned over the while, um, and really the mindset shift that Agile is. How many folks are working on Agile teams right now? Excellent, look at that. How many would consider themselves testers? Excellent. How many programmers in the room? Lots, good, good. How many manager type folks? Ah, I see that some people are doing more than one job. This is good, this is good, okay? When I think of agility, right, versus big A or little a, I think it's more, not so much a methodology, it's a way of thinking, right? It sounds so easy. How many people have found it really easy to implement? Not so many hands. Because it's not easy. And a lot of times it's hard because we really haven't made that shift in our, our head about what it means. I like Elizabeth Hendrickson's acid test, she calls it. Uh, Elizabeth Hendrickson is the author of Explore It, really good book about exploratory testing. I get the question quite often, how do you know we're doing Agile right? And that's a harder question to answer, but I think this goes a long way. Are you delivering software? Are you delivering, I'd like to say quality software, but frequently, frequently will depend on your organization, your product. Um, sustainable pace, and I think that's a key word that a lot of people forget. So sustainable pace doesn't mean you know, that, that uh, the programmers get to work their 40-hour work week all the way along, and then the testers, oh, we delivered everything at the end of the iteration, so testers have to work extra. I was with a team a couple of weeks ago, and that's what was happening. The testers ended up spending the weekend to test things so that they could declare it done. That is not sustainable pace, right? And then, of course, the ad adapting. And that's kind of fundamental. When I talk about agile testing, 
Uh, I want people to realize that part of that mindset shift is testing is an activity that happens throughout. It happens in tandem at the same time as everything else. It's not a phase at the end. And that's part of that mindset shift, realizing that testing is an activity. And that testing can be more and much more than testing code. Because when we start testing early, that's what we're doing is we're testing ideas, we're testing um, people's assumptions. That's also testing and that's what testing early is about. In our first book, Agile Testing, our final chapter was uh, seven key success factors. And so I'm not going to talk too much about them except kind of go through them. The number one success factor for teams, and this is something I think is really important, is the idea that the whole team, and when I say whole team, I'm meaning the delivery team, right? You have a feature you're going to deliver. Who contributes to that? It's the programmers, it's the testers, it's your product owners, um, business analysts, if that's what's on your team. That whole team is responsible for delivering. That means that that whole team is also responsible for building in quality. And it starts from the very first time somebody has an idea about a feature. So I use the word feature to mean some business capability, right? Um, your business people say, we want this. That's a feature. Features have many stories. Stories have many tasks, right? So we want to be thinking about it. But it starts when that first idea comes up and we start talking about it. Really important that that team understands what it is and really starts working on it. The idea of a mindset shift, agile testing mindset. Being able to start thinking more than uh, coding, more than my job is to test. It's really starting to think about how can we work together? How can we change our roles? How can we help each other? What can we do to learn more? It's the mindset shift that we talk about. The third one was automate the regression tests. I strongly and firmly believe that agile teams cannot be sustainable without some form of automation. Right? There's unit tests. There's testing at the API layer. There's testing workflows through the user interface. There's all kinds of automation, deployments, builds, right? When we think about automation, it's, it's automated tests. We're usually thinking about the tests that uh, the team does. But there's all kinds of other automation. But that regression suite is really important. The, to, have a, uh, sust sorry, to have a potentially shippable product at the end of an iteration, in theory, means we've run all our regression tests. And the only way to do that is to have them automated. Right? So to be sustainable, the team has to work on it together. It's not the tester's job. It's not necessarily the programmer's job. Maybe it's not, e it's not even that automation team over there. It's that delivery team's job to get that happening. The fourth one was feedback. And when we think of a, a tester's role or a, a person on your team that is their passion is testing, those people give feedback all the time. That's their information radiators. Um, raising defects is one form of of feedback and I actually think it should be a very small part of what they do. Asking questions is a big part of it, right? Trying to figure out who thinks what. So 
you know, you have two people in a room and you're talking, chances are you don't think the same thing. Somebody will say a word and you'll have completely different ideas what that means. It even gets worse if you mix cultures so that if you have uh, people in Singapore and then people in, so I'm from Canada in Calgary, so if we sat there and said the same thing, there's pretty good chances that we're not really meaning the same thing. Uh, we're thinking differently. So that feedback becomes a very important part of it. Core agile values, practices. It's amazing to me when I go into teams, and I see a lot of teams. I do a lot of traveling. And when I go into teams, a lot of times they don't really understand the basics. So how many people here have read the Agile Manifesto? Yeah, most people, not everybody. Now, how many have actually read the principles behind them? The second page. Fewer. Go read them. That's what drives Agile, right? That's really what we have to understand. There's a lot of practices like continuous integration, absolutely necessary, but that's not what makes Agile, right? It's those principles behind it. We have to understand the practices and the how they fit together, but the values are really, really important. The sixth one is collaborating with the customers. Not to say collaborating between testers and programmers isn't important, but having that business presence on our team, really important. How do we know we're building the right thing? It's only with that conversation with the business being there. And the last one was looking at the big picture. One of the things that happens often on teams is we get stuck looking at the, the small stories. Right? Looking at all those small stories, we forget that those stories are part of a feature, that the feature is part of a system. So having that big picture in your mind all the time really makes a big difference. So these were the, the seven from our original book. And um, it was interesting because <clears throat> when we wrote it, um, we had reviewers, really good reviewers, as we were going through. So we send out a list of 20 different uh, practices or 20 different things that we thought were really important, we being Lisa, my co-author, and I. We sent it out and we said, pick your top 10 and prioritize them. So most people, and there were about 20 different people that participated, about, um, they all come back with approximately the same top 10 but in different order of priorities, right? Some people thought um, collaborating with your customers was more important than the foundation of agile practices, for example. But every single person that replied had the same number one success factor, that that whole team really needs to buy into quality. Now, when we started doing the second book, we said, okay, we have to have a last chapter. We don't want to do the same thing. Uh, but what we, we decided to do was come up with these, we call them confidence building practices. And these ones really do support a lot of those ones from the first book. So I'll talk about using real examples, um, the idea of exploratory testing, uh, setting, um, testing your features, right? Part of that, don't forget your big picture, learning, because it's very important to continue to learn uh, the idea of sensitivity to context. And the last one is keeping it real. So these are the six I'm going to talk about tonight. Using real examples. We keep talking about using examples. I have a sticker on my laptop that says, use examples. But a lot of times we forget. So a story comes out. We talk about the story, and we go, okay, yeah, 
these are the rules behind them. And we all go away and we understand, or we think we understand. But when we walk away to go start coding or to start thinking about the tests, there's a discrepancy. We didn't really understand. By using real examples, not use a valid username and password. Say, no, this is what a, a valid username and password. Janet Gregory, password one, two, whatever that is. Real examples, because it's important. That's how people can, you can't misunderstand if you write and say, this is what it means. Real examples. By asking your customer, your product owner, whoever it is that's representing the business, when you say, can you give me an example, all of a sudden, they're brought into the process. They're brought into what you are trying to do, and they will help because they have a much better idea that you actually understand what they want. And that's important because that's how you earn their trust. Now, we're going to do a little, ex we're going to do a little exercise. Everybody likes, right? So I want you to find a pair, so one other person, one of you is going to look at the screen, and the other person is going to be looking away. Now, this might not work. Hmm. We have a problem. Do you know what? The, I've never faced this one before. We have screens on the side. <laughs> Anybody help me with this? Got any ideas? Can we turn those screens off? Thank you all. Oh, excellent. Ask for help. People will help. So now it will work. So find a pair. One person face the back of the room, and one person is going to be looking at what I show on the screen. It's going to be a picture. And I'm going to give you a couple of minutes, two minutes, to describe what you see to the person who's facing away. And then after two minutes, I'll bring you back and, and we'll talk about what you saw, okay? So find your pair. One person face the other way. Okay, does every... Can you turn it on? Thank you. Does it does everybody have a pair? Does everybody have a pair? If you're left out, then find three and two people. Two people uh, listen and one person talks. Okay, everybody ready? Are you faced away? Okay. All right. Go.
Stop! Stop! I... There we go, stop. Thank you. Very excited people, this is great. All right, so what I want you to do now is the people who were listening, turn around and look at the picture. <laughs> Was that what you expected? How many said yes? All right, how many, it wasn't what you expected at all? A few. All right, so have a seat for a minute. All right, so those who said it wasn't what you expected, raise your hands again. So can you tell me why it was different? Uh, well, uh, there was a, this, the, a perspective description of a background and a foreground. So the perspective? And that gave me a uh, kind of a built illusion that uh, the houses are kind of much further away. Okay. And then there was a description that the houses looks like what kids usually would draw it. So uh, in, in, in my context and culture, the rules would be just, just like that, not that kind Right. Of Hard to describe. <laughs> How many could describe those rules accurately? <laughs> right? Whereas, in my culture, all I would have had to say was it's a barn roof. And everybody would have understood exactly what I meant. Right? How, what else did you have different in your, pers in your mind? Who else? Nobody else? Everybody just a perspective in the roof lines? The number of windows. So, um, did your partner describe the windows, or? He just described the main one, which is the four windows, and neglected the rest. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, what was important to him that was not necessarily transmitted. This is one of the things that when when your product owners are describing what they want, it's really hard to do that. Now, this is a picture that you can all see. When you're talking about something abstract, just think about how much harder that is. So by using examples, drawing pictures. Now, if you had had a pencil and paper and could have kind of done a mock-up, much easier, right? So using pictures, using examples, anything that you can do to help your product owner get the message across, be able to get that shared understanding is really important because we have differences in what we're, what we're saying and what we're hearing. So think about that. Focus on the business and use real examples. This is my sticker I have on my laptop. Um, acceptance test driven development, a specification by example. Uh, behavioral driven development, BDD, they're all the same premise using different words to describe it. But the premise is always guiding development with examples. So let's create our examples from our, our feature has many stories. From those stories, when we start the discussion, when we start talking about examples, real examples, then we can start having a better understanding. So a lot of times we have a story. I'm hoping that everybody has acceptance tests. Some people might call them criteria. But the most important thing is really the conversation, being able to ask the questions, getting examples guiding development with them. Um, and once we get that, then we have this kind of magic that happens, uh, which is coding, testing, and automating. And at the end of that, right, um, we probably have some exploratory testing, and then we accept. 
but it is guiding development, starting with those examples, starting with that discussion to get everybody to have that shared common understanding. That is preventing defects, and that's really what we want to do. Uh, because every programmer I know, programmers in the room, do you like fixing defects? <laughs> no. Spend a little bit extra time understanding the story. Get receiving, ask. Programmers, ask for tests before you start coding, right? Preventative measures. Uh, the second confidence building practice is exploratory testing. Now, this is a skill that's not necessarily easy. Um, how many people here think they do really good exploratory testing? Come on, there's going to be a few, no? At least one brave person. Excellent. Um, but it is a skill to be learned like anything else. It's not ad hoc testing. It's having a, a mission, a, a charter. What are we going to do? There's lots of different ways to do them. Uh, I can explore as a persona, right? This is PayPal, right? So who uses P PayPal? Give me a user. Right. So you guys, I'm going to guess um, some of you, will be a regular user. I'm a, a young female. I'm just making one up now. Um, who likes to do a lot of transactions buying new gadgets or something, right? What would that person test like? putting on a new hat, trying to say, hey, or maybe it's a hacker trying to make, steal all the money that you've got in your PayPal account, right? Different personas, different users. You will test differently if you put a charter around that persona. A lot of times we will do, we will explore around the risks, maybe security risks or performance risks. Uh, tours, sometimes. Uh, there's, James Whitaker has a, a book out on tours, uh, but it's the idea is I'm a tourist. So if I'm coming to Singapore, what are three things I must see in Singapore as a tourist? Sentosa. Sentosa. Where I am. Okay. And third one? Chili crabs. Chili crabs. I like that. Yes, I haven't had any chili crabs yet. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell my, my person, chili crabs, please. Um, <laughs> Okay, that's a great one, by the way. But what are the three things in your application that must work? So you pretend you're a tourist, you design these tours as a tourist, and you go, all right, maybe I'm somebody who's coming in and I'm only in town for one day, so I just have to make sure it all works really quickly because I want to get to those three things. How am I going to do that? Perhaps you're a travel agent and you're looking for ways to do it. And so you're looking, you're designing your uh, exploratory test charter, you're looking for completely different things as a tour guide than you would be as the person who wanted just to get through them. So you do that for your application. Uh, most people will do uh, exploratory testing around workflows or journeys. That's kind of the most uh, that I see but there's lots of different ways to do it, right? We can, we can take and look at our application and do a great job on getting that shared understanding, preventing all the defects, making sure that we did what it was supposed to do. But don't forget to do that exploratory testing because there is things in your application that you forgot, you didn't think of. So exploratory testing it allows you to find those things. It's really important, and it has to be built into your time, or you don't do it, right? Number three, confidence building practice. This is about that, that not forgetting the big picture. How many like to do jigsaw puzzles? Do you, does anybody here do jigsaw puzzles? A few, yeah, I like to do them. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time most of the time. Um, this is a jigsaw puzzle that I started. I was going out to our cabin at the lake this, a couple of years ago, actually, <clears throat> going out for a week, and I thought, 
this gives me a chance. I get to, I'm not doing anything, no work. So I, I took the jigsaw puzzle out, put it on the table. I, I start by um, turning all the pieces over so I can see them, separating out the edge pieces, and putting them all into different shapes and colors. And then I put the edge together. And then when I was doing this puzzle, there was a lot of pieces that were very similar colors. So I had to take the big, the big um, pile of one color and divide it into smaller chunks. And I ended up dividing some of those into smaller chunks. And then I looked at the box and I went, what do I want to do first? Because you always take the, you know, I, I tend to take the most dramatic things. So the first thing I did was the mother's face. And then I did the little girl's face. And then I did the little boy's face. And I finished off the arms because that was the last piece of that color. And then I did some of the background because I could tell where the picture frame was, it come up. This is as much as I got done on that puzzle. I didn't finish it in that week, other things came up. When I was looking at that and I was trying to decide do I kind of put it away so that I, when I come back, I can finish it? Or do I just put it back in the box and say, next time? And it really started me thinking about what do we do in, in our development? You know that whole prioritization? The most important things? Well, that's what I ended up doing. I didn't realize it till I started thinking about it. I actually wrote a blog post on this. Um, but I did the most important things. Each piece of this little boy's head is a feature, almost, or a story maybe, right? But depending on how you're looking at it. But because it was prioritized, I actually put this away, back in the box, crumpled it all up, and I was happy because I did the most important things. So we really need to think about what it is so that when we complete it, we get that yes, check, and it's done. What is, none, what is not as important? So when I do a jigsaw puzzle of a landscape, the part that I leave for last is the sky. And if I never do the sky, I'm okay with that because it's just plug and trying different pieces, especially when it's all blue. But understand what the business needs and really understand that big feature. We need to think of the system, right? We get stuck at the story level, but how does it relate to the feature? How does it relate to the system? I'm a big fan of teams working together at a feature level, right? Taking that business capability, breaking it up into stories so that the team understands where it comes from. So the team understands the bigger picture, the feature. How, why do we want this story? Why do we want this feature? Because that makes a really big difference in how we develop it. Number four. Learn continually. I use a lot of pictures from um, my grandchildren. Um, this is my granddaughter many, a few years ago. She was, she's much bigger now. Um, but they are constantly learning and not afraid to learn. Right? So a lot of times we don't, as adults, don't play anymore. Right? Get down on the floor and, and play with your children, but also with each other, because we will learn that way. Doing the little game that we just did with the, the picture, right? It's a little bit of fun. Uh, that's how we learn, through observation. Watching other people, watching other teams. Somebody actually asked, I was in New Zealand last week, and um, one of the people in, in my course that was there, wants to bring his team. He'd like to bring them to Singapore. He actually asked that. And he said, 
are there any teams that you know of in Singapore that we would like to go see and see how they're implementing Agile? Because we'd like to watch and observe and talk to them. Can you observe other teams and see how they're doing it? Um, but from a personal perspective, learning. There's a weekend testers. Anybody ever um, participate in weekend testers? Nobody? One person? Yeah, right? By learning from others, because you're pairing and you're learning different things. That's what we want to start doing. That's how you start innovating. This is, um, again, this list here is from Elizabeth Hendrickson's a slideshow she did. But she talked about testers as have, needing these kinds of characteristics. Um, curiosity is probably my number one characteristic I talk about that I think people who are testing should have. If you're curious, you will learn anything, right? Um, so you want to develop yourself. A lot of people are talking about T-shaped skills. What is my strength? From a testing perspective, my strength might be exploratory testing, but maybe it's load testing, maybe it's something else, maybe it's security testing. But you need to develop that breadth across the top, knowing about the domain, maybe knowing a little bit about some other types of testing. From a programmer's standpoint, their depth will be coding, I would hope, right? But it might be different types. It might be back-end, might be front-end, it might be .NET, it might be Java, don't know. But their breadth, I would certainly hope, has a little bit of testing in it. From a testing perspective, I would like to see their breadth have a little bit of technical awareness so that they can talk to each other. Really important. Constantly learning, constantly updating skills. Right? Go back to that mindset. If we stop thinking, uh, if testers stop thinking about that their job is to find defects or to make sure everybody does that requirements that they're supposed to. If our job is to help, right? If everybody think on that team thinks that their job is to help deliver software successfully, what does that mean? It's a different mindset shift. And we will do anything we can to learn. What does our team need to learn? The fifth one, understanding your context. Because that makes a really big difference. If I go into one team, and I've talked to a couple of different organizations here in, in Singapore while I've been here, two totally different contexts. If I went into one team and said, hey guys, you should do what they're doing because this is much better, you should do it, it probably wouldn't work because their context is different. Now, some of the contexts I see is, is I see more and more mobile and embedded systems, right? Everybody has a phone. I was in a taxi today, I'm going to meet a friend, and the taxi driver couldn't get us to where we wanted to go because he didn't know. So I pulled out my phone, pulled up Google Maps, and said, here, can you show us? Does anybody have, does anybody go anywhere anymore without their mobile phone? No. So I don't know why the taxi driver didn't have one too, but he didn't. <laughs> At least not a smartphone, right? But it's in everything we do. And so that testing in a context in mobile phones is a lot different than testing on a website. We're thinking of different things. The first time I worked on an embedded system, I really understood memory to a totally different way of thinking, right? When you're on a computer and you're doing it for your, your PC, way different than looking at memory on your, on your embedded device. Context is different. You're going to have to learn different things. Distributed teams. All of a sudden, 
we have communication issues, we have time zone issues. So the kinds of things we're going to have to learn to deal with distributed teams are in a completely different way because we're not small co-located teams. We have to learn how to, how do I take my tests and give them to the programmer who's, oh, they're, li they're not in Singapore, they're in Calgary. How can we do that? Thinking about the tools and thinking about how we want to make that happen. Different contexts. You have to adapt. Large organizations. How big is PayPal? How many people? Is it, I, I, I know it's large. Do you know how many people in Singapore? 225. 225 in Singapore. Yeah. yeah. So that in itself is not that large, but I'm guessing they have many. Uh, all over the world is 13,000. 30,000. 13,000. 13,000. 13,000. Pretty big organization, right? If your organization is only 200 people, you will do things much different than if you're 13,000 or 50,000 or larger, right? You have to think about that that context is different. Anybody work in data warehousing? Yeah. It's different. It's much different. However, if we go back to those principles, those guiding principles, what can we do? To, to make that happen earlier, to test earlier, right? Um, and it's, it's amazing what you can do if you start thinking about asking yourself that question instead of, it won't work in my context because we're different. Instead saying, how can I take those ideas and make it work in my context? A different mindset because there's a lot of people doing data warehouse in an agile way now, very successfully. A lot of times we think about um, distributed teams on different con in different, different uh, cultures. And I know that's one of the things I like about Singapore is that we have a lot of different cultures here. You have a lot of different ones working together. It's quite amazing. But it's not always a um, cultural country, geographical difference. A lot of times we take and we have, oh look, we just bought you, so we're gonna absorb you into PayPal. And you have to be our culture. And there's a cultural clash between organizations, right? So there's lots of different kinds of cultural clashes, different contexts working together trying to figure it out. Did I miss a number? Number five? So What's number six? Maybe it was only, oh, yeah, I'm gonna go back to my other screen. Interesting. I think this is number six and I misnumbered. One of the things that I really, um, as a presenter, if you're a new presenter, Never, never, never do your first presentation to testers. <laughs> right? They catch every mistake you make. Um, but it doesn't matter whether it's number six or number seven, keeping it real. And I think that a lot of times we forget to keep it real. And what we're meaning by that is, is just being able to say stop, sometimes saying no, but too many times we, we get in our iteration and the product owner says, hey, I really need this extra story. Can you put it in? What should you say? No, we can't. Or a better way might say, we can fit it in our iteration. Which other one do you want out, right? Keeping it real. Yeah. Hey, don't forget, we also have to do exploratory testing. We also have to automate. We also have to do this. Let's put tasks up for those. Make it obvious. Make it visible. The more visible you make things, the easier it is to explain. The easier it is to say, 
No, and this is why. So you want to make it obvious, right? You're testing results. Don't hide them, make it visible. That's probably the biggest advantage of Agile is that it's transparent because we don't have to defend anymore. We just say, hey, this is what it is. I'll show you everything. Making it and bringing it back to the team if you're having a testing problem. We don't have any test environments that are working. How are we going to fix that? We can't go forward unless, right? Make it team problems, make it a team issue. Make it real. And really think about what that is, right? There is no magic. Actually, there is. I think there is. If I ask you, those are on Agile teams, and most of you are, if I say, who has felt the magic? Is there anybody who's felt the magic of being on a good Agile team? A few, right? It feels like magic. It does, but it's not really. We really need discipline because we don't live in a fantasy world. So when we say things, yeah, yeah, we can make that happen. You're giving false information to your product owners. You're giving false information to other people because it takes a lot of discipline to make that feel like magic. And it's when everybody works together, really is. So yes, my bug was in the number seven. It should only be six. That's that's okay, I can live with that one. I'll fix it. But these are the confidence building practices that kind of support those other success factors. And so when we're thinking about it, if we come back and we start thinking about that testing is an activity that happens throughout, that everybody on that team is responsible for quality. From the first time we ask the first question, we're starting to test. I think that's kind of really where we want to be, is everybody's in that place. Now, I'm not taking credit for this. There's two ladies down in South Africa that put this together. Uh, their company name is Growing Agile. But I thought it was kind of interesting, the testing manifesto, testing throughout over testing at the end, right? Yes, we might have to do some testing at the end, but we really want to bring it throughout. Preventing bugs over finding bugs. Because if we prevent them, then the programmers don't have to fix them. So much better. Testing understanding. So that's that testing early. Do we have the same understanding over checking the functionality? That's you know, the idea of going through scripts and making manual regression suite tests. Very boring. Um, building the best session, oh, sorry, the best system over breaking the system. So instead of thinking that my job is to break the system, let's work to build it better in the first place. And then the last one is team responsibility for quality over tester responsibility for quality because we cannot test quality in, ever. It has to be built in from the very beginning. So I really, really like this little testing manifesto. And so I think that's kind of a really good way to end this talk. And it is about quality and striving for it throughout the whole process. All right, so uh, 20 after 8. We have some time for questions, um, right? And we have a microphone. Oh, you're going to run around with the microphone? Excellent. I think it might be on from before. All right, so I will take questions. You guys, hopefully somebody has a question. At the back, yes. Oh, she's going to bring the microphone or? Oh, just a minute. 
Hang on. Oh. Technical technical glitch. Just throw this to the person. Throw this to the person? I can't throw that far. I can't throw that far. I'll just point. There you go. Uh, what kind of knowledge is required by the manager to really understand the agile tension that's going on? Because uh, I'm, I'm here to agile and I have agile team to manage. Ah. Uh, so, uh, I, so I also want to understand how much or how deep understanding is required for managing for the team. Uh, I think, now what's the most politically best way to say this? <laughs> Um, I think managers need to trust their team um, and not get in their way. Uh, they have to learn to think about different ways to understand what they're doing versus being in. Uh, they have to provide support to their team. So if they have a good understanding, uh, then they can provide support and say, you know, Chapter five might be a really good chapter for you to read, <laughs> right? You are the first person to answer the, to ask a question right. so you get the book. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Easiest way to give away a book. Um, but really, it, it's about um, having enough understanding so that you know where to point them to, right? Do you have to have an in-depth It'd be great, but then that means uh, you have to have an in-depth of everything. But understanding where to point them to is a really big part of it. And trusting is huge. All right, next question. So, oh, sorry, we need the microphone. Oh, she's got it. Hi, my name is Abhishek. So, uh, in the we often speak about the uh, testing pyramid. Ah, yes. Yeah, so uh, is there any, like, any ratio that should be maintained? Is it uh, three, uh, three layers? Right. The right. Any ratio that the team should maintain? So um, the test pyramid, I didn't show it on here. I've shown it so many times. Um, who doesn't know what the, the automation pyramid is if I say it? A few people. Can I have one of these? Uh, whiteboards pulled over and draw, or is there a flip? There, never mind. There's flip charts. There's a flip chart. Awesome. I can't explain things without drawing. So this is the pyramid we're talking about. This is to think about your regression suites, your automation. So this bottom layer, we say, are the unit tests, the programmer tests because they're very fast feedback, base of our regression suite. The programmers maintain mm -hmm. that when they're coding. So it's, the cost of maintaining is a lot less. This middle layer, API or service layer, underneath the user interface, they're pretty fast too, because they're not going through the user interface. If you don't touch the database, they're even faster, right? This is where we want to test our business rules if we want the business to see our tests. This is where our documentation can be. This top layer uh, is through the user interface. Um, usually workflow kinds of tests. These are the most expensive because they're slow. They take a long time to run because they're coming through the user interface all the way through the application, touching the database and back up. So they're slow. They tend to be the most brittle. So we say push the tests lower, right? We actually have a chapter in that second book that we gave that we talk about the pyramid and some of the different um, adaptations that people have done with it. And, but the idea is to try to get 
the best, uh, the fastest tests as your base. That's what you're wanting to do, push the test lower. Now, the question was, is there a, a proportion of tests that you should be maintaining? Not that I know of. I've, I've seen some people try to say, you know, that you should have it, but it will depend so much on your application. But we want to have, these tests are about building it right, internal code quality. This is about making it, the middle layer is about making it visible to the business, being able to test fast the business rules. And this is kind of a, just to make sure that the workflow actually does work. So we want to have the least through here, but just because these are really small, you will have the biggest number here, right? That's why the pyramid kind of works, but I don't know of any purpose or any specific answer. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? There's one at the back. Going to make you guys run. Uh. Can you talk into the microphone? Yeah, what's the steps that you show are mainly in ecology. Is there any testing tools that HL testing testers should adopt? Um, tools that the Agile tester should adopt. Simplicity. <laughs> um, right? I don't know of any one tool, but I encourage teams to find the simplest way that they can do it. Uh, things like mind maps are a really good tool to brainstorm new ideas. I know a lot of teams that actually um, will use mind maps to store their exploratory test charters and things. So you can do things like that, but make it as simple as possible. There's not, I do not recommend tools of any kind specifically because it will very much change on what you're trying to do. I'm central from IBM. So when we are talking about testers in Agile, right? There is no specific role called a tester in Agile team So yeah, some people say that. Yeah. Even in IBM, even with the practice is the same. We we are practicing for quite some years on that. We don't have any specific role called testers. And so how we can uh, we have a kind of a cross functional team, uh, sometimes the same developer. If you have no workloads, kind of, he can jump into the testing area from this perspective. He can even do the test. Right. So. I hope everybody does testing. Yeah. Yeah. So. So um, how does this work? Yeah. I'm not one of those people that say everybody can do everything. I think that's a fallacy, because I think if we genericize, if we make it too general, then you end up with a team of nobody can do anything really well. So I like the term generalized specialist. So I don't care if I call me a tester, though I'm proud to call myself a tester. I can be a, a developer because I think the teams are all developers, made up of lots of different specialties. So whatever you label yourself, I am going to guess that you have people on your team that are passionate about one thing, right? So what, if a person is passionate about something, that's what their core competency is going to be. I started off as a programmer. I went to university, I learned to program. I programmed for my first six or seven years. I knew that I would not do that for the rest of my life. I did not love it. It was not my passion. I was okay at it, but it wasn't my passion. When I moved into testing and had that opportunity, I found it, right? I, I read testing blogs, I read books, I read this. I don't remember the last time I picked up a C++ book or a Java. I, it's not there. I will keep up my skills to the point where if I sit and talk with a programmer, I know what he's talking about, I can read his code, but I would not code again. And so what is your passion? Don't take that away from people. Don't do that because they will become a generalist and they will stop reading anything, in my opinion. That's my opinion, okay? So be very careful. 
So I'm not one of those people that think everybody should do everything. We have passions. Not everybody agrees with me. And that's okay. Hi, I'm Victoria here. Hi, Victoria. Hi. I'm very interested in the certain test driven development, the uh, flow that we have yes. uh, given, right? I just want to understand how it's being applied in the job. Because when we start, uh, usually for each screen, we will start with the user story, the product manager will do the prioritization of the user stories. When is it that there is this uh, sharing in terms of feature? And uh, who's supposed to, like, in which phase? Because in pure agile, I don't see that. And also, there's this acceptance test that you draw a beautiful diagram, which I love it, because this is exactly what we need, right? But yes. if you're agile, actually, I don't see this type of well, being, <laughs> being shared. So there is no such thing as pure agile. Just that there isn't. There might be pure. There might be pure Scrum. Yeah. Yeah. And and you're right. But Scrum does not talk about practices. They don't. They talk about bringing um, how you get stories from the business into the rest, and they talk about um, how you work with it, but it doesn't ta talk about uh, programming practices. It doesn't talk about testing practices. So you do have to go out. Um, and so there's lots of books that describe acceptance test-driven development or specification by examples. Goiko's books are really good. Uh, so there's ones out there that describe I think it starts, and I think that it's really important that the product owner doesn't go off and make up the stories all by themselves. I think that the team needs to be involved because that's how you get testable stories, is the team is, is getting involved in doing that. So as you're doing your uh, backlog refinement sessions, that's when those conversations happen. Right. So uh, the proposal would be the product as well refinement is together with the, the rest of the team. I firmly believe that. Okay. Uh, how about the high level acceptance test? Would that be inside your user story as part of uh, what you've written in your user story? So, oh, yeah, no. you have your user story. It's one sentence, right? One sentence. Not enough. So when you're talking about the user story in your backlog refinement meetings, I, I, my preference is to call them story readiness because that's what you're doing is getting the stories ready. Um, when you're talking about that story, you have the conversation. I like to start with the acceptance tests. What is the scope of this story? Can you give me an example of desired behavior? What do you expect? That becomes that acceptance test the high-level acceptance tests, and have the conversation exploring examples around that. Examples of uh, the desired behavior, examples of misbehaviors, what if kinds of things. Um, and it comes out of those conversations. But you want your product, the product owner owns the acceptance tests. Doesn't mean they have to do it all by themselves, right? Um, but it, it yeah, and that whole conversation, um, you should come on my course. <laughs> so this is more like a conversation rather than everything you prepared inside the user story kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So the explore, explore examples, all this, the acceptance. Uh, you need, sorry. So I'm going to, can I, can I, I'm going to stop because this, you, we could have this conversation all night. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think there's some other questions. Um, but I can, if you send me an email, Janet at agiletester.ca, I will give you lots of things to read. Lots of things to read. Thank you for your interest. Yes? Hi. So, uh, pertaining, I'm still reading your first book. Pertaining to the four quadrants. Pardon? The four quadrants. What do you want to do? Yes. Uh, I believe the key one is more for programmer kind of like testing. Quadrant one is so for programmers, yeah. So actually does the tester do TDD together with the programmer? I've seen um, testers pair with the programmers um, on, on doing unit tests and things. I've also seen testers not necessarily pair with them, but 
help review to say, hey, sorry if you're my, the person. Um, I would be glad to sit with you and pair and review your unit tests. Did you think of this? What about this? So I've seen that as well. I do believe that the programmers should be responsible for their unit tests because that's their safety net for their own code. Um, so I, I personally don't like to see, even though I know teams do this, say, can you go write my unit test and then I'll write the code? I don't like to put that off. I don't want a tester to write those unit tests. I would rather the programmer do. But if a tester can pair with them, that's great. I think that's absolutely great. I don't see it very often, though. The same way I'm asking this is more the important category whereby um, yes. we XY measure, write a test, someone made a test pass. So kind of enjoy that kind of collaboration and interaction. Yep. Because in your book, you mentioned that the tester, uh, not the tester, the programmer, you do TDD is more of thinking of the design. Yes, it so is. If a tester pair with a programmer and he can't write the test or he can't do the implementation, so what exactly is the role when it's paired? That's why I'm so I, I, it's interesting. Um, I, I have never seen particularly that a tester and programmer pair on that, right? I've heard Microsoft used to, I don't know if they still do, but used to have a, a NestDet, a software developer in test write the unit test, give it to the programmer, and let the programmer pass it. I don't like that at all. Uh, and, but I've never really seen them pair on the actual development, right? Um, mostly because if you have a tester on a team, they tend to be, do I would rather see them writing the business level tests and having them prepared for the programmer. So, yeah. But I'd like to see it happen. So if it does happen and you have an experience report, Send me an email and tell me about it, because I think that would be really interesting. So basically what we have done is more like, uh, it's incremental, right? Yeah. And so it's just maybe you, you just say what the test is doing, then immediately, because you are carrying two of it, it's just beside it. So one is an aggregator, the one is a driver, so the right. next person just immediately pass. Then the person who write the code immediately convert to a tester, you write the test, then the person write the implementation. Mm. Okay. Is it working well? Making pair programming and TV work. Working together? Cool. I like new experiments. I think it's great. Yes? Hi, I'm Kenneth. In your slide measure, the word magic, can you share with us how, what this magic is about? So everybody that put up their hand that said they felt the magic, they knew what I meant. Um, Every once in a while, and I don't have to explain. The people that went, I think, maybe, I feel it, maybe, they're the ones that have been on the edge and, and almost felt it, but it's not there. The ones who go, what do you mean? You're not anywhere close to doing, to being agile, right? Because you can't, you don't know, you can't imagine what it feels like, right? I can't explain it. It's the, the cadence that a team gets. It's that everybody's working together. You get good retrospectives. You're working together. It's a feel-good kind of team. And so if you've never felt it, it's really hard to explain. But if you felt it, you know what that means. I've been very privileged to be on several teams that I felt the magic in, right? A lot of people get one or two in their lives, and I've been on several. So it's, it's, it's a nice feeling. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But it does exist, that feeling. So work towards it. All right, yes? Uh, just on your last couple of slides, uh, you had about making things a, Real? a team problem. OK, yes. And um, shared responsibility, yes. team responsibility for testing testing yeah, and quality. Do you have uh, suggestions on? on how to achieve that, especially with people where traditionally testers are responsible for, for all these things. Yeah. It sometimes takes a long time to get that. Um, sometimes it takes a lot of courage, right? So one example that I use is uh, we were 
we were implementing um, our top layer of our pyramid. So we were writing some tests uh, through the workflow. And we were using a tool called Ruby and Water. Um, and when we were doing it, we were spending a lot of time on maintenance. The first iteration, we just we put in a couple of tests and we're going, oh, we're spending too much time. And so we took it to our retrospective and we said, hey team, programmers and everybody, we're spending a lot of time on these these tests because you programmers are using dynamic IDs and we're having to change these tests every morning when you add something new. What can we do about it? That's the key. What can we do about it? So keep asking that kind of question. So the programmers responded in a very nice way because they wanted to help and they said, well, we can actually start putting um, names on those objects. Will that help? And we said, yes. So they did that, and it did. It helped a lot. It cut down our maintenance, but we were still having the backlog. Next iteration, the retrospective, we said, so much better, but it's still making us do work. Is there anything else? And as somebody, and this is where that technical awareness comes in. So the programmers, of course, say, well, that's a lot of work. Right, programmers? That's a lot of work. I don't want to do it. And so my, my answer to that, or my question was, don't you guys have a search and replace function in your IDE? And they kind of went, eh, right? And I just said, how long would it take? So we did the math. It took them a half a day to make all of the changes and retrofit all of the object IDs versus us spending that 20 minutes, half an hour, every morning fixing our tests. It was a no-brainer because we sat there and we worked. But it takes a long time for the team to realize that you can work together to make those things, to make that happen. Um, but it's a constant, how are we going to address it? So if a tester says, it's my problem, I've got to fix it, you've taken the monkey. Don't take the monkey. That's part of keeping it real as well, right? Chocolates work really well with programmers, too. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I, just one last question. Um, <laughs> 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 I don't know. Yeah. What time do we have to be out of here? Who, where, where at? Yeah. <laughs> Soon. <laughs> they're they're going to kick us out. So changing requirements, one question. Is the product owner changing in the middle of an iteration? Yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that, right? If they want to change something in the middle of an iteration, that's keeping it real, right? Let's stop the iteration. You want to change it that much? Stop the iteration. Let's have a, a new iteration planning meeting. Keep it real. If they're doing that in the middle, then they're disrupting. It's a team responsibility to say, okay, we're going to stop. Let's replan. It's, it keeps them from doing that. So yeah, that's, that's a part of that whole keeping it real. All right. I'll turn it back over to our organizer, Riju. Thank you so much, Jack. Uh, I think a large piece of software delivery from Singapore is going to improve from tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> We've enjoyed it. Thanks so much.
Thank All you. All right, thank you.